All right, welcome everyone back to another episode of CRNA School Prep Academy. I'm Jenny Fennell, your host in CRNA. And today we have a very special guest episode. Um, today, I actually have been getting a lot of requests from students all the time about uh, regional anesthesia. And I know you guys have um, probably be familiar with uh, Jeff Moulter, but today we brought in his partner, um, Scott Uregal, and he is here. He is the actually part, works with Jeff Moulter and he's the founder of Block Buddy. Um, so if you're not familiar, that's a regional um, application that you can use during your regional rotation during school. So today we're going to answer some of your questions around doing regional anesthesia and also kind of how to go about using this app to help you do that. So welcome, Scott. And if you wouldn't mind telling people a little bit about your background and kind of how you started Block Buddy. Yeah. Hey, Jenny. So thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here uh, with you today. I've heard lots of great things about what you've been doing. Um, so yes, I'm happy to be here today. So yeah, so I'm Jeff's other half. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so the way Better that Block Buddy, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, just don't tell Jeff. Um, so the way that Block Buddy came to be was, you know, Jeff and I started doing these weekend conferences several years ago, and things have changed a lot since then. But at that point, we're trying to figure out how do we like send our content with our lectures um, home with our attendees, and we looked at okay. You can do printed material, which gets costly and it's kind of getting, you know, maybe outdated. Then it turned into what we do sort of flash drives, uh, an ebook, that kind of a thing. And we're like, yeah, it's all been kind of done already. What can we do to make it a little bit different? And Jeff goes, well, why don't we do an app? I'm like, yeah, app seems kind of cool. Great. <laughs> but at that point, like I've told the people in the past, at that point, I've never, I don't think I even purchased an app. So I just kind of said, great. So I immediately went and started exploring about, okay, how do you develop an app? Do you pay someone, a developer to do it? Well, that costs a lot of money. Is it something I can do, but I don't know coding? Um, so long story short is I found a company that I could start to develop the, the app on myself. So it really started out as this something that was really small. I think we had about nine um, blocks on there with some really um, unprofessional type <laughs> um, illustrations, you know, mm -hmm. pictures that I kind of mocked up myself. So they weren't of the highest quality. And we kind of just put that out there. And so let's just see where it goes. And so it had nine blocks with some pictures, a few videos, and then it just sort of really kind of, kind of organically just developed on its own. Nice. And before you know it, you know, we started, you know, people started buying it. And we're like, wow, people actually like it. And then the cool thing was to watch when people were buying it in different countries. Because mm. when you go to Apple, you can start to see, okay, people purchasing it from these different countries. So that was kind of cool to see that start to happen. And then just sort of evolved. And before, before you know, we knew it, we started having a medical illustrator. And then we had two medical illustrators. And then it kind of grew. But it got to a point where um, I didn't know anything about apps and I didn't know about how to develop them or the selling of it and the marketing and what I came to realize um, early on was whenever you sold an app on Apple or Google they took 30 percent mm. right off the top wow yeah so you start looking at 30 percent's gone right off the top your medical illustrators lawyers and there's really wasn't much money in the end in fact we were losing money for for a while <laughs> oh, no. yeah so really oh, we had a horrible business model <laughs> we didn't know what we're doing. Um, so then we finally paired up with another company, we redeveloped it and, and had more content. We continued to add content to it. And it kind of is, that's where we are kind of today um, with the app. So nice. Well, very cool backstory. And it just goes to show that, you know, you guys, business is, it's, it's not hard. It's, it's, there's a lot of ups and downs. And while there's a lot of great things out there, I don't think a lot of people think about behind the scenes. They just see this app and they think, oh, this is great. They must be making tons of money from it. But what you just shared was actually you've had some ups and downs with it. And while it's, a, it's an amazing product today, you know, first getting started, you had a lot to learn about all of that um, and also how to make it so it was um, usable. And um, how many blocks are you up to now? Like, I want to say there's 30. There's like 30. 435 or I just got new images back last night actually oh, my okay. so we have the forum block coming out um probably later this week or early next week that will be added I'm working on um stuff with like the uh, nociceptive pathway and then I don't want to let too much information out but working on something regarding non-surgical pain management as well Ooh, awesome so hey, how exciting. well hey yeah. 
it's a little teaser then it'll be a teaser. So yeah, so it's growing. That's exciting. Um, it's a great resource, but, um, I know for me as a student, it was a very stressful rotation because well, first, you know, a lot of the tips or skills you learn in the ICU, you do apply in anesthesia. However, regional is completely different. Meaning you literally have no experience whatsoever. You don't even really understand local anesthetics other than what you learn in class. And now you're here expected, like we're at least nice to you. You've titrated vasoactive drips. You've given narcotics where this is a completely new realm of drug and type of technique that we provide as far as anesthesia goes. And so students are scared and it's overwhelming. And I think if anyone's kind of like me, I go in there and I just feel like a fish out of water. And even though I can read, you can read textbooks and I wish block buddy was around back when I was in school. Cause Holy cow, cow. I mean, the videos, the, the images you provide in there and also just the, you know, the standard how technique and landmarks and everything wouldn't have made my life so much easier to whip that out and do a quick little, uh, uh, memory because you might study for one type of block that you're going in the next day to do. And then next, thing you know, you have an add on or you're thrown into a different assignment and then you're kind of freaking out. because it's not what you prepared for. Um, so I guess if you had to say, what's the number one barrier that SRNAs face when learning anesthesia or regional anesthesia? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. And in my experience, you know, our facility, we used to have students rotate through to learn blocks from, from Jeff and I, mm -hmm. and, um, the one thing that Jeff and I noticed was that the biggest barrier are the students themselves. And what I mean by that is that we found that the students who came in prepared and excited about blocks learned the most and did the best with that rotation. And so that sort of then prompts the next question is, well, what does that mean to be prepared? You know, mm -hmm. expand upon that. So 80 or 90% of what we do with regional anesthesia pertains and relates to anatomy. So study up and know your anatomy. If you can really have a strong grasp of anatomy as it relates to the various blocks, you're gonna do a lot better um, compared to those students who just really struggle with that concept. So no muscles, no fascial planes, no nerves, um, vascular structures. If you don't already know cervical, brachial, and lumbar sacral plexus, now's a good time to, to brush up on those. And I think probably of those three, Brachial plexus is probably the most, I think it's uh, the one that you're probably going to be exposed to the most just because a lot of upper extremity blocks. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I really would brush up on that information. And there's lots of resources for that, whether it's Block Buddy or other online material. Mm -hmm. um, there's an app that I use personally in the past called Complete Anatomy. I think that's what it's called. Mm -hmm. um, and there's other ones like it. But the thing that really um, caught my attention with that is you can kind of build your models and then you can sort of peel back the layers. And as you're doing that, you can really start to explore um, how the nerves travel throughout the body and how they're in proximity to um, different structures that either you want to stay away from or, uh, or that's going to help guide you to your target. Um, and then the other really cool thing about it is you can actually take that model and then start to rotate it on your screen. Hmm. So it gives you sort of like a 3D representation. Okay. And I think as a student, if you can conceptualize in your mind what the anatomy looks like in 3D, I think it really helps you um, uh, with your scanning and with driving the needle um, to, to perform the block. Yes, I would agree. And so complete anatomy, interesting. And um, one of the things I think that I know, and I did some regional too, is um, when you're seeing it live, <laughs> It can, you, you need to be practicing, like I said, visualizing the anatomy in a 3D way, because when you have the, the ultrasound probe on the patient, you're going to be seeing a 3D image or, you know, you're going to have in real time, you're going to see the intercostal muscles moving. Um, yeah. You're going to see the subclavian artery beating, you know, you're going to see these other little structures that you're gonna like, you know, you're going to question, what is that? Is that, I don't want to hit another artery or, well, right. you know, so you have to be comfortable with going in with the needle and knowing what you're seeing. So you don't or you're not fearful essentially of hitting anything you shouldn't be hitting. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, and what you're seeing in a static 2D image, mm -hmm. um, a textbook or online is very different than what you're gonna see on, on the live patient. And in addition to that, everyone's anatomy is different. Not everyone is created the same. And that makes our job that much more exciting, right? Mm -hmm. um, otherwise everyone could, could just, you know, do a block, but you know, um, 
everyone's just wired a little bit differently and God created us a little bit differently. So this makes it a little bit more challenging uh, some days versus, versus others. But I always laugh about um, whenever we taught lectures or whenever we put stuff in the app, we always find like the most ideal, perfect textbook image, right? Mm -hmm. You see that you're like, oh, this, this doesn't look that, that difficult. Then you go to yeah. work and you're like, this patient does not look anything like that image there, right? Right. So um, yeah, so it can, it's not misleading, but it's we do this to build you up to make sure you have a, an understanding of what it should look like. Exactly. Ideally, but in reality, it's it's not quite look. Yeah. And I think sometimes it's just hard to find the image because of the anatomy of the patient or whether maybe how, how deep the structures are located within the patient. Mm -hmm. um, I know like a popliteal block, I mean, you're, and you're putting a decent amount of pressure from the ultrasound probe when you're scanning and especially, you know, the, the, the deeper you have to go with the ultrasound probe more, usually the more blurry the image is, right. um, which can make it really kind of hard when you're really trying to decipher between where, you know, where's my C6, you know, in the brachial plexus and you want to get right around that. So right. it definitely can be tricky, but like, um, Scott was saying, practicing, visualizing with pretty images that are near perfect. So yes. even if you see a fuzzy image or an image that you're kind of hundred percent not certain, you're going to know what you should be looking for. And so that's kind of the key to being able to decipher. Okay. I know what I should be trying to see right here. And this is I can identify you, then you want to start by saying, what can I, what can I identify in this image and where can I work towards what I should be seeing so that you can safely do the block? Um, uh, yeah, so there's, there's, yeah, there's no question. I mean, just at least having an understanding of the ideal anatomy and what it, mm -hmm. would it look like an image? Just again, it's serving as a reference, Correct. but make sure you understand though, not every, most patients are not going to necessarily look like that some days. Mm -hmm. Yes other days not but at least you have sort of a frame of reference as to what you you know uh should be looking for but what it boils down to though too is is just doing a lot of repetition right mm -hmm. as a student and even when jeff and i started first doing blocks um you know kind of going back to when you first were mentioning earlier about you know having references and mm -hmm. it being overwhelming it was overwhelming for me as a CRNA when I first started doing this because I only use the old fashioned um, nerve stimulator technique, mm. right? Using your reference landmarks to um, essentially do a blind technique. And <clears throat> I was successful with that. And then when I started using ultrasound, I thought I struggled with it, right? It mm. felt like you took an eternity to do the block. And uh -huh. you're saying to yourself, it's taking me longer to do this block with ultrasound. Why am I, why, this is stupid. Like, why yeah. am I doing this? And so mm -hmm. it took time before it finally sunk in. Like, this is the best mm -hmm. thing ever. It's just such a game changer, um, not only for us in our practice, but also for our patients, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're using less anesthetic. We're in some cases avoiding um, uh, administering a general anesthetic and patients are fast tracked to recovery, very little if any narcotics, mm -hmm. pain-free, and we avoid all those other unwanted side effects with opioids. So right. it's just made such a huge difference uh, for patients. Oh, for sure. Um, especially now that the introduction of Expirel, which is, if you guys are not familiar, that's a, um, it lasts for up to three days or can potentially last up to three days. Um, just a game changer. The fact that it gets you through surgery, the pain of surgery and up to three days post-operatively. I mean, think about by then, hopefully after the three days, a lot of the swelling and inflammation has, has subsided. So you will overall naturally have less pain. Um, it's an awesome thing. And even like, uh, he was saying the anatomy can look different. I've seen, you know, when you do a popliteal block, the common peroneal and the tibial in some patients, you can't combine them. You have to do them separate, meaning they're so spaced so far apart from one another that you have to do almost separate blocks versus trying to surround them all in one area. Um, yeah, so that's, yeah. that's, that's a great point, Jenny. Um, because when I've always taught students, I always say, okay, when you're doing a, a pop sciatic, you know, you can, you tend to see them pretty easily at the pop mm -hmm. crease because they're superficial, right? And they they sure. tend to be very hyperchoic or bright and they kind of jump out at you. But as you go scan up the back of the thigh, as they're coming together, they may not come together all the way, mm -hmm. but they start to dive deeper. And then it becomes mm -hmm. a little bit more challenging to, to block them. So you're right. I mean, block them where you see them the best and, mm -hmm. Maybe you have to throw a, a, a few extra CCs of local in there to, to get good coverage of both, but the end result's going to be the same. Mm -hmm. Another cool thing too is if you're ever struggling, not to sidetrack, but if you're ever struggling, 
with a pop sciatic block and you can't see both nerves clearly, have them dorsi and plantar flex the foot. And then each nerve seesaws back and forth. Oh, yeah. Awesome. So just have the, just have the foot dorsi and plantar flex. Uh huh. And if you do that, you'll see the two nerves just seesaw back and forth on the screen. Man, I wish I'm going to pass that little tip bit on. I don't know why no one's, I, we, we did them quite a few of them. No one ever told me that. So that's a good, I'm going to have to tell my, uh, my block friends yeah. that. <laughs> I think it's, I think it's, I think it's in block buddy. Oh, okay. Is it? Oh man. I missed that I one. I didn't read carefully <laughs> enough. <laughs> um, okay. Awesome. And then, um, I guess what tips would you have for students who will be at sites where they do a bunch of regional and even possibly students who maybe don't do a bunch of regional? I know that that would probably be, if I was a student, I'd be concerned too, if I didn't have access to a lot of regional. Yeah. It seems like there's a, a mixture of students at mm -hmm. different programs and not to, to their fault or even maybe the, the program's fault. It's just right. you're, you're subjected to um, your clinical sites. Um, so so for those students who are actually going to places where they, they do a lot of blocks, mm -hmm. I would, if, if I'm a student, I'm, I'm going to figure out what blocks are the most commonly ones that they perform mm -hmm. because, you know, there are dozens and dozens of blocks. And if you think you're going to know all of those blocks in and out, the reality is, is you're just, you're not. I mean, as a student, you're already inundated with a ton of information. So make your life a little bit simpler, find out what the, uh, the blocks that they do the most. And then hone in on those ones there and review content that uh, you maybe had in your lectures that pertain to those blocks. Um, and you can find that, if, that information by either talking to your fellow students who've already rotated through that site, um, contact any preceptors or CRNAs at those facilities that maybe are your go-to um, contact people and just touch base with them to, hey, I'm Scott and we rotate with you next month. Um, I want to start to prepare a little bit and, and be ready for my rotation. You know, what sort of advice do you have for me? What kind of blocks do you guys commonly perform? Um, and then review that content. When you get your assignments the night before, figure out what blocks you're going to have to do the next day. Brush up on those, um, those blocks. But uh, then again, you might get that ad like you, that you talked about and that gets kind of, you know, kind of thrown on your lap. But at least if you've already did some reviewing mm -hmm. on the most commonly uh, perform blocks at that site, chances are you're, you're probably still going to be okay. Um, I think the other thing that I would do is when you're at that rotation is be assertive, but in a good way, show that you're interested in learning blocks. Um, I always found it um, maybe feel warm and fuzzy when I had students say, hey, I really want to learn blocks. Can we spend some time scanning? Yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's do it. Like if you show me you're really interested and you're hungry and you want to learn, then it makes me excited as your preceptor to want to share my, my knowledge with you. So if there's any time during the day that you have with your preceptor to talk about the blocks, to maybe scan each other um, or scan anyone who's willing to lay down and serve mm -hmm. as a model, do it. I mean, that's, that's the way that that job I learned. We would read up, watch videos, and then we would go to work and scan each other behind the curtain. People ask questions like, what are you guys doing back there? <laughs> but that's, that's yeah. the only way I think you're going to get comfortable is you have to put that probe in your hand. You have to mm -hmm. scan as many people as you can, because like we talked about already, everyone's anatomy is going to be a little bit different. So the more you expose yourself to just putting that probe in your hand, getting comfortable with it, learning the different movements with um, that transducer, the more comfortable you're going to be um, that first time you actually do a block on the patient, but nonetheless, you're going to be probably pretty nervous. Um, so do whatever you can to at least, you know, increase your odds of success. Yeah. I like that. And that actually is going to work both ways, you guys. So even if you're not getting, get, going to get a lot of experience, um, like Scott said, scan, that's the very minimum you can do. You don't have to actually stick a needle in someone. I mean, I know that's part of the process, but if you at least get familiar with anatomy and scanning and trying to find your landmarks, even if you're not going to see a lot of, of blocks, it's still a good way to practice. So when you do get the opportunity, you're going to feel more than confident and say, Hey, I can do that block. So as a student, sometimes opportunities present itself in a weird way. You may not always be expecting it. So if you're at a rotation that maybe doesn't have a lot of uh, regional, but you've been spending time practicing and scanning and the attendings and the CRNAs know this, when a block does arise, they're more likely to come get you and take you out of your room to go do the block because they're going to know that you've been proactive and trying to scan and get ready for this. Um, so uh, like Scott said, it goes a long way when you show that initiative and show that um, passion to want to learn and allows everyone around you to know, hey, they really want this. Let's make sure they get this experience. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, and if you could, and even if it's not your patient that's going to be blocked, but if you know that there's a, a, another patient prep who needs to get blocked, then it, even if it's not your patient, say, hey, you know, I know you're, whether it's an OCRNA or an anesthesiologist, a physician, um, say, hey, you know, would you mind if I just shadowed you and just watch you do a block? I, I have some free time. Mm -hmm. and, and just watch because, again, you're just absorbing that information. You're just watch, watch them hold the probe and scan and, and do different things. And maybe they'll give you a couple of, you know, tidbits along the way to, to kind of help you out. So this, the more you're, you're exposing yourself um, to this, you, the, the better off you're going to be. Yeah, I hundred hundred percent. And yeah, like you said, you're showing that initiative to to watch them. So see, you know, they're gonna know that you've that you've watched them do one. So next time there is one, they're more likely to give you the probe, and maybe they can help you with the needle while you hold the probe, or they can maybe introduce it to you slowly. But at least the fact that you're showing initiative to do it. Um, another thing too, and I don't know if we mentioned this already, I don't, um, is make sure you know what common doses, meaning um, or how to dose the. Um, how to dose the block because all sites seem to have a slightly different cocktail and what they like to use. Um, so just make sure you're, you're, whether you're talking to an upper classmate or an actual CRNA, ask them how they like uh, to go about using what drugs they use for certain blocks. Yeah. You know, I remember that it takes me back when I was a student many years ago, when I did my OB rotation, we used to pass this, someone came up with this sheet because mm -hmm. there were several different attendings we worked with. And each one had their own individual cocktail for dosing epidurals and spinals yeah. and stuff like that. So we shared that. So that way you were ready to go. So I think that's that's actually good advice, Jenny, is just, um, again, figure out ahead of time, like what are your typical blocks and what locals do you use and what volumes do you use and concentrations? Mm -hmm. You include any additives in there. Right. And again, if you can come to the table with head information, as a preceptor, I find that most impressive mm -hmm. that you, you're showing that interest and desire to to want to, to want to learn, and it's just going to make it a better rotation for you, and you're going to become a better practitioner for it. Yeah, hundred percent. And like you know, Scott said, coming to the table prepared and knowing what to expect, even though yes, you've never done it, it shows that you've taken initiative to talk to other students, to find out, to talk to CRNAs. Um, it just overall paints a better picture than versus going in there and saying I don't know what to do and just not knowing anything. Um, so I guess, uh, what tips do you have for keeping the needle in view, which is definitely a very hard, much easier said than done. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, um, that's definitely a, a good question, uh, that, you know, it's variable from patient to patient and the type of block you're doing. But so first and foremost is obviously I'm, I'm going to assume that you're doing an in-plane approach, which is probably the most commonly used approach. And, and for anyone who's not familiar with that, I'm going to use my trusty visual aid, which is just my remote for controlling my computer. So if this is my, if this is my transducer, right? So mm -hmm. the in-plane just means you're advancing your needle along the long axis of the transducer, which means you should be able to see the needle tip and the shaft of the needle the entire time you're advancing it. So mm -hmm. What you'll find is sometimes you're scanning, especially if you're new to doing box, that your hand's going to drift. You know, if you're mm -hmm. working up by the neck, especially, mm -hmm. you think about it, you're on the curvature of the neck, um, you got all this gel and your hands sliding all over the place. So you have to make sure that your needle and your transducer are in, are in the same axis, number one. Now, even then, it's not guaranteed you're going to see your needle, but it's it's a good starting point. <laughs> um, so what you can do first and foremost is when you're holding your transducer is hold it low. Um, in your hand. So essentially the, the, the transducer is going to rest up in kind of the, the kind of the crook there of your hand, mm -hmm. hold it low. And then when you're scanning your patient and you find your target structure to help minimize the drifting is, and you can actually rest the side of your hand or your palm against the patient. That way you sort of, you lock your transducer up against the patient and you're less likely to have it drift around. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, once you've done that and you get your needle in the same axis as the transducer, then you have to sort of look down and say, okay, I'm lined up, I'm good. Now it's just a matter of doing little movements where you call it tilting the transducer, where essentially you're tilting it, you know, stuff lad caught at your patient, just doing this. You're not sliding it, you're just tilting it to get the um, angle of the beam to line up perfectly with the needle. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I've been told um, that if you look at the thickness of an ultrasound beam, it's about as thick of, as, as a credit card. Mm -hmm. So you have to get that beam lined up perfectly with a needle for it to illuminate and show up on your screen. So make sure one, it's in the same access. And then two, once it is, 
then it's, it's just a little these movements, these fine tuning movements to sort of tilt the, the needle. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would recommend is when you're doing the block and you're inserting your needle, come away from the transducer a centimeter or two when you're doing maybe like a, a more superficial block, like an interscaling block or a uh, femoral nerve block. So you're not inserting your needle where you're right up against the transducer, because if you do, you're coming in at a steeper angle towards your uh, target structure. So you want to come away a little bit so that your needle is coming in now at a flatter angle. And theoretically, the more parallel your um, needle is to the transducer, the more likely you are going to get those echoes reflecting back up to the transducer, which then creates your image up on the screen. So therefore, your needle should be um, easier to identify on the screen. Now, if you're doing a deeper plexus block, let's say you're doing um, like a QL3 or a transgluteal sciatic, um, and those are much, much deeper, then I'll come away that much further, maybe two or three centimeters from the transducer. Again, the whole concept is I'm coming in at a flatter angle. Now, um, if you're doing a deep block and you're still, you're farther away, but you still feel like you're pretty steep, you can now take your probe and call it's uh, called healing. We are applying pressure on the side of the transducer away from your needle insertion site, applying pressure up against the patient. And what this is doing now is it's bringing the um, transducer more parallel with the needle. So if it's, this is a steep angle, you're applying pressure, now your needle's a little bit more parallel with the transducer. It should help um, bring it into view a little bit better. But even by doing these things, it's not always guaranteed that it's gonna um, improve the image. You can try making sure you're using an echogenic needle, which is just a special needle for ultrasound guidance. I don't know if it's necessarily um, if that much uh, more helpful for some of your superficial blocks, but it's definitely helpful for the deeper ones like the QL3. Mm -hmm. um, where it just helps enhance the needle visualization um, on the screen. Some machines also have built-in needle identification software, like um, we use Sonosite. Mm -hmm. So the older machines have, it's called MBE, which stands for multi-beam enhancement. The newer Sonosite machines is called SNP, Steep Needle Profile. So all it is, it's a built-in software um, on the machine that you actually have to pay for as an upgrade. <laughs> but um, it will sort of illuminate a section on your screen. And the whole concept is it's supposed to help enhance the needle um, when you're advancing it uh, through the patient. Hmm. Um, and in some instances, it does help. In others, it's just, you know, no matter what you're doing, you could use your echogenic needle, you can have on your steep needle profile, you can be doing all those different things. And in those instances, you still can't see the needle great. Mm -hmm. And so in those cases, what I do is I look for the movement of the tissue around the needle to help guide it. And I go very, very slowly towards my target structure. And then periodically, I'll just take um, a syringe of saline and I'll just give a CC hmm. and then look for a little bit of dissection uh, as you see the saline move through the tissue, just to kind of help guide you um, towards your target. And I think those things usually work out pretty well, but again, you know, when you get to some of your patients who are a little bit um, larger body habitus, fat is not your friend. Right. And it, uh, it causes a lot of refraction of mm -hmm. your um, ultrasound beam. So it just makes it tough to find your target structures and to visualize your needle. But at least those are some little, little tips to kind of help improve your, your odds of finding your needle. Those are all really great tips. Um, and what I can say too is I know I had learned in school, but it had been very, a very long time since I had done it. And so when I started working at a facility where they were doing 20, 30 blocks a day and with one CRNA doing them all, um, I kind of underestimated how fine tuned when you, you say fine tune, it's extremely fine movements with the probe. Um, yeah. you will always probably start off by moving it way too much. Yeah. Um, it's almost not even noticeable movement. Like it's extremely, extremely small and slow. If you go too fast, you may miss it. Um, yeah talk about credit card thickness. So again, you, you quickly miss it if you're moving it too fast. So it's not only is it small movements, but it's really slow movements. Yeah. Um, and I love the fact that you mentioned don't hub it because that going steep really makes it hard to find your needle versus like you said, going more parallel, um, makes it a lot easier to see that a luminescent, um, 
from the bean. Yeah. So yeah, and as you also the other thing too, Jenny is if if you're if you are very close to the to the transducer, not only is it your your angle steeper, but if you have to reposition needle mm -hmm. and you want to maybe come in over top of let's say you're doing an inner scaling block mm -hmm. and you got under C seven, now you want to back up and come up over top of C five. Mm -hmm trying to back up and get that angle sometimes can be a little bit more challenging. So yes. again, come away just a little bit. Um, and again, the more you do blocks, the more comfortable you're going to be. And the, and there's going to be uh, some small errors you're going to make along the way and you'll sort of figure this out. But these small little things, I think will at least increase your, your chances of success. Yeah, hundred percent. I've definitely been there, done that where you can't, your needle's always going to be straight. <laughs> you can't just bend your needle and go up over where you want. So you, yeah. you go steep like that. You're very limited on changing the trajectory of that needle without coming all the way out and going back in. Yeah. Um, so yeah, very good. Very good point. Um, so that was great. And then also you guys to make note is um, <laughs> Jeff Moulter made a YouTube video, which it's funny. I think last time we talked, I think it's gotten tons of views, but there's, he has a video on how to make your own um, practice needle bag or practice bag where you can actually practice. Yeah, I think it's called make make a cheap phantom. Yes, thank you. Make a cheap phantom yeah. so you can practice on a dummy essentially. Um, so yeah, check it out. It's on YouTube, um, Jeff Moulter. But uh, how can students, I guess, become more proficient with an ultrasound scanning um, a needle placement once they kind of have some of those basics that we talked about? Is there anything that you suggest as far as, um, or is it just like you said, kind of hands-on practice, just repetition? It is, it's it's a ton of repetition. And so it's kind of what we've already talked about, whereas, you know, if whether you have a lab at school or you're at your, your clinical site, um, if you have other classmates with you, I mean, literally Jeff and I scan each other nonstop. Mm -hmm. Any nurses that, hey, you mind scanning? Yeah, sure. Now, some blocks, people may not be as willing to be a model for you, right. but, you know, but for most of them, you know, it's, you can, you know, keep your, your, your tops on and pants on, you don't have to like, you know, expose too much of your body. But um, the more you do, the more you scan each other, scan yourself. If your CNA is willing to scan you, I mean, I let my students scan me all the time. I didn't, I didn't care. Um, so this repetition is it, the more you hold that probe and scan and learn to do those tilting and sliding and sweeping movements, those help you a lot. Um, I think the other challenge is, okay, once you get comfortable with scanning, now it's now you're introducing the um, idea of now inserting a needle. So mm -hmm. I would never let my students um, insert the needle on me, just not getting paid enough. <laughs> yeah. that to happen. <laughs> so, um, you know, if you have any blue phantoms or any other types of phantoms to at least get practice um, pulling the transducer, now advance your needle and learning you know, how to do those little movements to bring your needle into view. Mm -hmm. um, I know of other people or heard of other people getting like chunks of tofu and different cuts of meat and then wrapping it in saran wrap and then scanning it. That can get a little messy. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think probably most of your clinical sites would probably look on that too favorably. <laughs> so um, the next option, in my opinion, is, is making that cheap phantom that, that mm -hmm. Jeff um, has that video. I mean, it's Super cheap, all is essentially is a 500 cc bag of saline or LR that you empty. Mm -hmm. You put this um, powdery stuff in, I forgot what it's called. Um, you pour it in there, you, you pour in water with food dye and it makes that water turn into uh, like a gel. Mm -hmm. And if you want, you can put little things inside there to give you like a target. Mm -hmm. And then you just clamp off the little nipple on the end of the bag and scan and poke it. And then, you know, when you're done with it, you just chuck it and you can make another one. So I would, you know, I would consider doing something like that. Okay. Uh, very good point. And then also something to point out to you guys, when you are, are doing your blocks, um, when you get close to that nerve, you, well, first of you hit the nerve, the patient is going to let you know, <laughs> so it's going to hurt really, really bad. Um, and same thing, like if you start to do your injection and you're right up against the nerve, the same thing, it's going to cause excruciating pain. Um, and that's also why we use a nerve stimulator. I, I, um, I don't know if you have any quick tips on the nerve stimulator as far as are there certain blocks that you um maybe let's kind of cover like what what blocks would you not use it for maybe and then all the rest of them would you, would you use it for like, yeah so as a general i like so you'll you it's a very subjective um uh thing you know just uh -huh. some people say I don't use it all. I don't need to use right. it. I have ultrasound. I see what I what I need to hit or what I need to block, not hit, but what I need to block. Um, I like to use it regardless. So 
I use it for pretty much all of my blocks except for um, a lot of the, the fascial plane blocks. So things like um, erector spiny blocks, QL blocks, tap blocks, PEX, uh, anything where I'm not really injecting directly around a nerve, mm -hmm. um, I won't use it mm -hmm. because you're, you're, you're just sort of in the potential space where nerves travel. Mm -hmm. But for everything else, um, I use it. I even use it for my adductor canal blocks. Oh, interesting. Um, and you know, you, with an adductor canal block, you're primarily targeting saphenous. But the reason I use it for that block is because the nerve to the vastus medialis is not contained in the adductor canal. It's just outside it. Mm. And so as you advance your needle towards the adductor canal, um, I will often come in contact with that nerve. So by having the, the nerve simulator on there, it just gives me some feedback. If I start to see the vastus medialis muscle twitching and contracting, then I know I'm adjacent to it and maybe I need to adjust the angle of my needle so that I don't go through that nerve and cause nerve injury. So um, I use it for that purpose. Um, you could also use that, that simulator for the intention of finding that nerve if you're you're performing that block for um, a procedure involving the knee because that that knee or that nerve does eventually um, innervate the uh, the knee capsule. So some people want to block that nerve specifically. Um, the reason I like to use a nerve stimulator is not with the intent of locating that that nerve. If I can see my structures very clearly on the screen, then I'm confident in what I need to block and where those nerves are located. But my reason is that I want to help mitigate that risk of causing nerve injury. And using a nerve simulator provides objective feedback as to the proximity of the needle tip to that nerve. And I'll document it on my record. So in other words, if I'm performing, let's say, an interscaling block, I have the nerve simulator hooked up. I start it, the intensity of the um, uh, stimulus at 1.0 milliamps. I advance it towards the, um, the brachial plexus. If I don't get a, a, a response, that's fine. I don't have to. I don't have to elicit a motor response. And as long as I'm confident what I'm seeing, then I'll do my injection of my local anesthetic. But if I should elicit a motor response, then I'm going to turn down my uh, stimulating current until that motor response goes away. And then I'll note the strength of that, that current. As long as it's at least 0 0.3 milliamps or higher when the um, motor response goes away, then chances are I'm probably extra neural. So mm -hmm. I'm outside the nerve. And then I feel like I can go ahead and safely uh, inject a local anesthetic. So again, I'll, I'll, I'll document that on my block record, the type of response I elicited, the strength of it when it uh, occurred, and then the strength of the current when it goes away. Now, if it's less than 0.3, milliamps, then I will not inject. Mm -hmm. And what I'll do is I'll just reposition my needle. I'll reassess, turn the, the current back up to where the motor response occurs, and then dial it back down again until it goes away. And then as long as it's greater than 0.3, then I'll go ahead and, and inject. Yeah. But that's just one piece of the puzzle, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one, that's one piece of trying to help mitigate the risk of, of injury. But we're also using the patient, what they're verbalizing to us. That's why I don't like to um, sedate my patients too heavily, just so they can provide some subjective feedback, um, any paresthesia they're experiencing. Again, document those, um, and then save your images on the ultrasound machine. Yeah. I'll save a baseline before a block occurs, as well as maybe two or three throughout the course of the block, um, not only for medical legal reasons, but also what we're finding over the last few years is more and more um, insurance companies are asking for proof that the block was performed with the use of ultrasound guidance. Oh, okay. So, and without that, they won't reimburse you for that. Wow. All right. Well, good to know. Um, yeah, definitely make sure you, and I know like for me, we had a nurse in the room and they would be the ones in charge of taking pictures, but every now and then, if we were short staffed, we would be doing both. And so you just, you can't forget that part. You have to, so it's not, un, it's unfortunate when that happens, you have to lean over the bed and make sure you're hitting the button, but, um, right. Definitely with your third hand, yeah, third hand. Yeah, I was with my toe. Oh my. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, and 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 also, if I could just expand upon the whole nerve injury thing, is I also like to document um, any pre-existing conditions that they have. So, mm -hmm. for example, like a lot of our shoulders that we do, I'll ask them, "Do you have pain in the shoulder?" Yeah. Well, you know, where's that front of the shoulder, the back of the shoulder? Does it radiate down the arm? How far down does it go? 
any limited range of motion with the arm, any um, numbness or tingling going down to the arm or hand, and mm -hmm. document all that stuff. So, you know, document that, the, uh, the stimulating current, the um, saving your, your pictures. And um, I think it's just one thing just to kind of cover your butt um, because we know what happens, right? A nerve injury occurs and automatically we're the ones to blame because we're the ones with the sharp needle that was doing that were uh, that we were doing the nerve block. But we all know that with, you know, there's different phases when injury can occur. Either there's a baseline injury, mm -hmm. that's why they're having surgery. Um, believe it or not, surgeons can call, cause yes. nerve injury, right? <laughs> I mean, they're the ones who are with all, the, you know, jamming those trocars yeah. and stuff into the yeah. shoulder. And, um, and, but then there's also the post op period where injury can occur, right? So someone has a numb upper extremity mm. and they're sitting on this really hard armrest and it's resting there for hours at a time, causing a, a compression injury to the nerve that they don't realize is happening because they have um, uh, a nerve block already uh, in existence. So, I always like to make sure I tell my patients, you know, make sure while that block is working, elbows, everything is well padded. It's not being compressed, um, at least until the block wears off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all really great points. And I really, the key takeaway, you guys, is documentation. Um, you can't document enough. So um, I guess for all the buttons that are on the machine that might be a little overwhelming for some students, um, what are some key um, components of the ultrasound machine they should be aware of and kind of know before they get started? Yeah, you know, we could probably spend hours talking about machines and transducers and all the physics of ultrasound, but um, most people are probably don't want to hear all that. Yeah. <laughs> but so, you know, there's so many different makes and models of machines, right? Some have different bells and whistles, um, but they all have the same basic function that you need um, to go into a patient's room and do a box successfully. It's, you know, it's really, it's a limited number of buttons that you really need to know how to use. Mm -hmm. And with a lot of machines nowadays, a lot of things are sort of automated you know, with auto gain and all these different features. Oh, nice. So, um, but in short, whenever I'm going into a room, here's kind of like my thought process that I kind of go through real quick. So first thing I consider is, okay, what type of block am I performing? What's the patient's body habit is? So based upon those two things, I'm gonna determine number one, what type of probe do I need to use to perform a block? You know, some facilities, you don't have a choice. You get one probe, yeah. good luck. <laughs> so, you know, we're spoiled. We have four different probes in our Wow, our that's facility. a lot. <laughs> um, so yeah, so, and that's because it was our own group. So we, we bought two machines and have four probes. So we're, we're spoiled in that respect. So I, so I, I determined what kind of probe do I need? You know, so there's two basic probes that we use in with ultrasound guidance for, for peripheral nerve blocks, right? So you have the a high frequency linear mm -hmm. and you have the low frequency curve linear. So rule briefly, high frequency linear transducers, right? Have a frequency range somewhere around, um, with sonocyte, it's like six to 13 megahertz. So what that means is the higher the frequency, the greater the resolution. So the better detail that that image is gonna be on your screen. The downside though, is that that ultrasound beam can't penetrate as deep. Mm -hmm. So that probe is ideal for more superficial blocks like a, an upper extremity block, whether it's an axillary, interscaling, superclad, femoral. Um, curve linear is a lower frequency. So it has a range of about two to five megahertz. So lower frequency equal, equals lower resolution. So your image quality isn't as good, not as much detail. But the upside, though, is that it can penetrate deeper into the body. Mm -hmm. That type of probe is a good for abdominal stuff, um, tap blocks, QL blocks, uh, um, transgluteal, subgluteocytic blocks, something where the target structure is much, much deeper. Mm -hmm. So that's just kind of a very brief overview of high frequency versus the low frequency curvilinear. Now, my next thought is, okay, I'm picking that, let's say I'm doing it near a skating block. Now I'm gonna say, okay, I have my high frequency linear transducer on my machine now, I have the ability to, to adjust which frequency range in that six to 13 megahertz do I wanna use. Mm -hmm. And on sonocytes, they have three different features. It's either called res, gen, or pen. And what that means is if you select res, you're gonna use that higher frequency range, maybe 11 to 13. Gen is sort of the mid range, and then the um, pen is gonna use that lower range, maybe like six to eight megahertz. Hmm. And so which one you're gonna select is gonna be dependent upon 
again, which block you're going to be performing and the patient's body habit. So if I go in, I'm going to do uh, interscaling. Most times I'm going to select res. Mm -hmm. But if I'm scanning and I'm saying, well, I'm not getting as good penetration, then I'll hit the button and I'll select gen. Mm -hmm. so, that's, that's, so that's my the next step. The, the sort of the third step is, okay, adjust my depth button. Mm -hmm. And I always set my depth deeper than what I need to perform the block. And the reason being is, again, everyone's anatomy is a little bit differently. So I want to see everything I possibly can on the screen. And then once I find my go-to structures, then I'll adjust the depth accordingly so that my target structures are sort of in sort of the central third of the screen where the focal zone is the best and where your image quality is going to be the the best. Mm -hmm. But if you start out too shallow and your target structures are below the screen, you're going to be scanning all day long. You're not going to, you're not going to find what you're looking for. So mm -hmm. I always said deeper. And so again, like when I'm doing an inner scaling block, um, I set it around a depth of three. If I'm doing an infra clab, I set it around five okay. and then kind of go from there. Um, the other button that we need to be familiar with is the gain button. And that's essentially going to adjust more or less the brightness of your image. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll turn it up a little bit and I'll start to scan. And then I'll, if it's too dark, I'll turn it up a little bit. And sort of like your calibration of where your brightness should be mm -hmm. is if you're scanning over muscle, the background of most of the muscle should be a little bit on a darker, um, kind of a light grayish sort of appearance. And you should be able to see some bright white flex or mm -hmm. specks throughout it, like a piece of meat. Mm -hmm. that's sort of like your calibration of like where you're at the right gain. But the tendency is that people like to really crank up the gain a lot. And then what you're going to create is, is a washout effect on the screen. Mm -hmm. And everything's going to sort of sort of blend into one another. And it's, mm -hmm. it's a little bit more challenging to distinguish one structure from another. Mm -hmm. So you sort of want sort of a happy medium. The last button you're going to be wanting to know where it's located is the save image button. Mm. Right. So when you want to save your base on image and then your two or three other uh, images throughout the course of the procedure. So that's that's sort of like a brief overview of the most relevant button. It's kind of like when you're going to a new facility, where's a silence button on the monitor? Where, <laughs> how do I quiet that thing down? So those are sort of the, the few buttons and features you should really kind of know how to operate. And some machines is going to be a, a knob or a dial or a button or you got to scroll through a different screen. But those are features and functions that are available on every single machine that you're going to be able to use in your, in your practice. Yeah, that's, that's awesome overview, especially because it's not as overwhelming when you break it down like that. It's not too many things they have to really know. It's just those are the main things. And that's going to be repetition every single time you're going to need to do these things. Um, so, yeah, those are all that's been awesome. And I guess I want to kind of sum, summarize all this with um, when students get to the regional rotation. How can Block Buddy uh, be beneficial for them during their regional rotation? Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, like I said, when I first developed Block Buddy, it was this very simple and we sort of expanded it. And over the course, as, as I've expanded it and I've added new content, I've always sort of kept in the back of my mind, all right, what was it like to be a student? And so I've tried to sort of build this in such a fashion that one, it serves as a quick reference or in a bullet point format that it sort of cuts through. Uh, like a chapter book. So instead of having to read paragraph to paragraph, like it cuts to the chase. I have 10, 15 minutes before I got to do my block. I need to brush up. So whether it's um, your first time doing a block or you just need a quick review, we set it up in such a way that it, it cuts to the chase and lets you know the indications, the distribution of the block, um, the technique, you know, equipment that you can be using. So it helps give you some guidance in terms of, hey, do I need to use a high frequency, low frequency? Um, do I need to use a 50 millimeter needle, 80, 100? So it gives you some guidance. It gives you some clinical pearls as well. Now, in addition to the block, so we also have, um, you know, like I said, there's, we have hundreds of, of uh, illustrations and ultrasound pictures. I think we're coming close to 90 videos oh, wow. um, help with the reference. But then we also start to um, cover stuff like the basics of ultrasound. So it goes into more depth and detail about some of the things we touched upon a little bit today. Mm -hmm. um, we cover some POCUS. Oh, which, cool. you know, so gastric ultrasound, airway yeah. assessment, things of, of that nature. We cover a little bit of that. Um, we give some details about cervical, brachial plexus, lumbosacral plexus images, um, different types of blocks you can use to block those various branches associated with um, each plexus. 
there was information about anticoagulants and antiplatelet medications, you know, when to hold them, how long That's should huge. it be. And I also went in and I uh, had to really had to like do a review because it's been a long time for myself, but to go in and, and um, come up with diagrams and, and brief explanations about the cyclooxygenase pathway, coag cascade, um, coag in inhibition, fibrinolysis. So there's diagrams and pictures and descriptions of that in there as well. Um, we get into non-opioid medications, additives. We talk about local anesthetics, um, you know, the properties of locals, um, recommended doses. So we really try to encompass lots of different things, not just blocks, but a lot of things pertaining to that field. So I really kept in mind um, how this can really benefit students, um, not just for blocks, but maybe some other areas um, in your practice that you know might involve the use of locals and, and that kind of a thing. So. Um, yeah. and it's, and it grows, it's continually growing. I mean, I'm, I'm working on this thing every week. So, right. Right. That's awesome. No, it's definitely, it's grown even a lot since I first started using it myself. Um, you guys have added so much just in the last couple of years, really. Um, it's, it's been, a, it's been a lot in the last few years. I mean, yeah. this is really, for me has become a, um, a second full-time job. Nice. Oh, geez. Whenever I work, whenever I work at the end of the day, I usually go back and work a few hours every night. Uh, on it, trying to build content, you know, and we're also looking not only at content, but also like the function of it, you know, mm -hmm. and trying to improve the offline access feature, you know, because oh, we yeah. recognize that some people don't have good internet access mm -hmm. at their maybe uh, rural sites. Um, so we're, we, we have an offline function that we're improving upon. And so we're going to be resubmitting some stuff to Apple later this week nice. to um, improve upon that. And we're looking also, we're in the process of redesigning the app too. Wow. So we want to go back to some um, navigation features that were available on the original Block Buddy that we feel like, you know, users, we did a survey and we found most users liked more of the scroll down method than mm -hmm. the side swiping. So we're going to change up some navigation features um, on the app and the menus and make it um, maybe a little bit more user friendly. Mm -hmm. um, but the other functions that we really like too is the, you know, when the original app came out, it was uh, whenever you bought an app through uh, Apple or Android, it was if you transfer from an iPhone to a uh, Samsung Galaxy, yeah, there's different operating systems. So you can't transfer those. Well, we set this up. It's a we now have a it's called the progressive web app. So once you buy the app, it's yours. You could transfer devices, you can have both devices currently and use it on both. You don't have to repurchase it, you don't have to transfer it. You can use it on your computer, your desktop, any mobile devices. So it doesn't have to be just your phone. Wow. Um, so yeah, so we definitely took that into consideration too. That'd be great for studying. You know, a lot of students use iPads, so you could have it open. You could study, take notes. I know a lot of people love, you know, taking notes on iPads. So that'd be a good. And you can take notes within the app too. Oh, You nice. have a notes feature. So if you, it will be uh, within each block that mm -hmm. you, that's described. So if you maybe have, little tidbits that you felt were helpful for you mm -hmm. um, or you wanted some sort of reminder, you can type it into your note section on the app and, and have those go back to. Wow. Oh, very cool. So I guess um, let's kind of talk a little bit about, I know you do kind of specials for students. So let's kind of get into what kind of discounts are available for um, SRNAs um, for subscribing to Block Buddy Pro. Yeah. So we recognize that, you know, students are poor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We were, we were all there at one point, right? Exactly. So we, we want, you know, I really wanted to do whatever I can to make this more accessible and more affordable for students. So we have a, a student discount program where it offers 30% off for oh, students. So that can be applied to either your, um, to your first year or your first month. So our subscription plan is monthly or an annual. Mm -hmm. So obviously if you do, if you, if you get the annual, you'll serve, save a lot more money, mm -hmm. um, versus the one-time monthly discount. So the way that we work this is um, if people can either contact me at scott at myblockbuddy.com or they can go to myblockbuddy.com and click on uh, one of the tabs that talks about the student discount program. But in short, we typically will coordinate this through either a program director or a faculty member who will coordinate this because what we don't want to do is be inundated with individual requests from students. It mm -hmm. could just be burdensome. So right. Um, we, we coordinate it through usually a, a, a program director or a faculty member. If you, if a student can't find a, their director or a faculty member who wants to coordinate it, then I have worked with students individually who were sort of the point of contact. Mm -hmm. And then I just would then provide them with 
uh, a PDF file that lists the instructions of, of what you need to do to download it. It has the code and mm -hmm. then they can then distribute it to the students accordingly. All right. And, no, that's awesome. And you guys, I'm going to listen to the show notes, um, some of this information and in the website and things like that. And also, like Scott said, first and foremost, check with your program director. Now, if you're a newly accepted student, you might be, because I know a lot of students are like, oh, I even have students contact me who want to get Apex right away. I'm like, well, it's cool. They're just a little Slow bit, down. just yeah. gained acceptance. And, you know, so I want to emphasize that let's get you into the program first and get started. Um, once that happens, again, if you talk to your program director and they don't have any information for you about getting Block Buddy, um, then that's when you can come to me. You can reach out to Scott and we can help you. And maybe we can get, um, like a group kind of uh, group together where we can all, you know, go in separately and do this another way. But um, just, you know, there, it is out there, there's a discount for students, but to check with your program first after you've started your program um, to get more information about it. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, as a, as a new student, it's probably something you don't need uh, right out of the gates. You know, you might want to kind of get in there a little bit before you start getting closer yeah. to you your rotations and stuff like that. And we recognize that. So, I mean, save it for when you really need it the most, but you know, it, the discount's not going away. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's not, there's not a limited, we we plan on doing this for as long as Block Buddy is around. I mean, Jeff and I have been very passionate about working with students. We love um, helping them out as much as we can. So mm -hmm. even when we've had students who, you know, reach out to us, I've had CRNAs reach out to us, hey, I'm doing a block today uh, coming up, you know, this is the block I'm doing. And can you give me any little advice or, what block would be best for this type of surgical pr procedure? So we've we've worked with people, um, you know, throughout you know the course of a clinical day, and, and they've, they've sent a, a message to us. So we're we're happy to help out in any way we can. So, I mean, if, if students want to reach out to me directly, I'm I'm happy to help facilitate in any way. Well, thank you, Scott. And one thing I can say, just based, I know you and Jeff both are just like the most kindest people. <laughs> you guys both have big hearts, and I'm excited to share this uh, block buddy with you guys because again. Um, Jeff and Scott here are just good people. And like Scott said, he just genuinely wants to help. And he remembers being in your shoes. Um, he created this app to, for you to utilize, um, during school. Again, it would have been an amazing resource that I wish I would have had back when I was studying, uh, regional anesthesia. So for sure, put it on your list of things that you will want to get when you get to that area or arena and clinical where you will need it. Um, and Scott, thank you so much for joining me today for this episode. It's been full of so many wonderful pools, pearls and wisdom. Um, I appreciate your time and we'll have you back sometime for sure. Yeah, no, I loved it. I mean, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to come here and speak with you. I, again, I think you're, what you're doing is, is awesome to help out students and, and potential students. So um, I would love to come back on and, and help out in any way, shape or form. So, I mean, always feel free to contact me. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Right, you guys. Um, tune in next week for the next episode. And thank you so much for um, joining us today. Make sure you give us um, a review, thumbs up, wherever you're watching this YouTube um, podcast. And we appreciate you. And thank you so much.